Thank you again for being here. And uh, what we're going to take a look at today is kind of the role of AI and what it means for us as creative people. So you yourself have a long background in technology, but also have a background as a photographer. Let's start to just sort of establish your credibility as an artist yourself, because I think it's always good. You know, people get a little hesitant when they hear people talk to them about technology. They go, oh, well, they don't understand my challenges or they don't understand what it's like to struggle with creativity. So tell us a little bit about your photography and your background as an artist, and then we'll go into how you've embraced tools and help shape these. Sure. Um, well, uh, first and foremost, I've been a musician all my life. And so uh, I started taking uh, rock photography early on. Um, it just it just came natural. I was uh, I had a rock and roll video company way back in the in the eighties. <laughs> to date myself, um, and I always good liked time for capturing music. <laughs> it was yeah, it was seventies were I think better for me, but <laughs> um, but lots of great stuff. But I, I always loved capturing the moments that people don't always get to see in, in music, right? Whether it's the, you know, the handoff of a guitar to its tech, or if it's a, a nod and a wink between the two musicians who are switching apart in songs, stuff like that. And um, unfortunately, since I was working with a lot of musicians, they just kind of gave me free reign. So I started doing um, photography in between shoots and stuff like that and have started with the, you know, the analog world and quickly moved to digital and had some great mentors along the way, um, you know, uh, Vincent LaFerre, uh, who does aerial photography, who's amazing, uh, Asa Mathat, who does a lot of uh, Silicon Valley portraits and things like that. And just from the technology side of things, they were really inspirational. Uh, and, and one of my favorites that I got to work with uh, is Nick Rock, who's famous for his rock photography. And his whole thing was always like, he didn't care about the technology. His whole thing was always about capture the moment whatever it takes, capture the moment. And so, you know, in, in being around him when he's done some shoots and things, he's the least technical person of, of all the stuff that I've seen, but yet he captures stuff that's iconic, represents some the most, you know, from the Lou Reed photos, the David Bowie photos and all that stuff. And they capture a moment and they're, they become more than just the photograph that they are. And so when I started, you know, I've, I've had a lot of luck uh, an opportunity to photograph from Paul McCartney, the Rolling Stones, Sean Lennon, uh, just a whole slew of things that are on my website. And, 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 and I do other types of things, but I really enjoy the, the rock photography the most. But it's always challenging because, you know, you're fighting crowds, you're fighting, you know, sometimes big stages. So you're running around with all this gear on and all that kind of stuff. And it becomes like a sport. <laughs> yeah. And, and that's an industry where the technology and innovations in cameras have had a huge impact on music photography. I, I remember, you know, back in school and right after school working for a small music magazine and having to go buy my ISO 800 or 1600 or higher film to try to pull it and, you know, hoping for the best and seeing what I got. And, and now shooting on full frame sensors with autofocus and face tracking abilities, it's, it's, it's a whole new world of what becomes possible. Does technology changes like this, how has it affected you as an artist? You know, were you always open to technology? Did you find that, you know, technology just gave you more opportunity? Yeah, absolutely. It's always just another thing in the bag of tricks. Um, I think the best advantage that we have today is that you can get some immediate feedback from your style of what you're shooting um, versus, you know, it, like the days when Nick was shooting, you know, Lou Reed on stage or something like that. And he'd say, I think I got it. And then he'd look at it and it was blurry or something. And, and, oh, well, I, I wish I had known, um, where now, you know, I, you can start a shootout and you can go, cause a lot of times on the, the cameras today, especially if you're doing auto stuff, uh, big stages will, will screw it up. They'll actually fake out the camera and uh, whether it's autofocus, things like that. And I find like, you know, you can't just go out there and say, shoot auto, everything will be either oversaturated or it'll be, um, you know, it just won't have the right balance to, because the lights aren't there to light the photographer's work, they're there to light an artist. And so sometimes you got to go in there and, and I always will shoot manual because I'll go in and I'll do a few test shots first and I'll, 
a look at you know how the light, what the temperature of the light that's hitting for different songs and stuff like that. It's great if you can get into sound check. Um, but the technology parts, especially sometimes with an autofocus, if there's a lot of motion going on and you want to capture somebody running or something like that, that's where it comes in handy and, and things like that. But I rarely will use any any other the other auto settings just because what the camera thinks is right and what you're trying to capture on a stage is usually they're they're different and nobody's really solved that problem in an auto setting and I I wouldn't want them to. It's it's more fun and challenging to go out there and try to capture a moment like that and make it iconic somehow. Yeah, and and what we're seeing here, and you bring up a good point, is that you as the artist are still in control, which is a nice segue. You could choose which technology is helpful to you and which technology isn't helpful to you. And you could still turn those features on or off. It's not like you've bought a fully automated camera. So you also have a, an important role over at NVIDIA uh, not everybody understands what NVIDIA does. You know, they may know you for your gaming cards if they, you know, they work in that industry or if they are a creative professional and they've made the investment in a higher end GPU, they've seen some of the acceleration that you guys bring to tools like Photoshop or Premiere Pro. Give us a little bit of your background with NVIDIA. And then also, if you want to share uh, some of your past history, you've worked on a lot of important technologies through the years. Um, I've been very lucky, and actually, I feel like I've worked with NVIDIA ever since they started, even though I've only been at the company a number of years. Um, but we use GPUs back at ILM. I was CTO there, and we were using GPUs for rendering and doing uh, physics and simulations and things like that. Because what NVIDIA has become, like they, they, yes, a lot of people know us for the gaming cards, things like that, and we still do phenomenal gaming cards. But we're an AI data center. Right. There's so much more to the company right now from, you know, from autonomous driving, robots, uh, you know, all sorts of things. And we're working on this platform called Omniverse, which is really the connector for the metaverse. It is a open platform that comes with a lot of technologies developed by NVIDIA, physics, simulations, real time photorealistic rendering. Um, all of these things are at this platform level and then it connects to just about any of the third party tools that are out there in the industries of uh, media and entertainment, in games, in architecture and manufacturing, robotics, healthcare, research, on and on and on and on and on. And um, it, it's really such a completely different company than it was just a, a short number of years ago. And, and the beauty of what we're doing is uh, we're affecting change across the, these different verticals. Um, and we're doing it with partners. Like we're not you know, out there being a walled garden, telling everybody it's gotta be our way. We're out there being very open, saying we can help your industry in this area and you can help this platform and other companies in those areas, things like that. And we're seeing this real great cross-pollination of technologies. So it's, a, it's an exciting time to be here. So specifically in the world of photography, you know, I know you guys have done some partnerships there. How is AI impacting photography? What are some changes that we might have seen or not even realized we've seen. Like, you know, for example, and I'm not saying that this is your technology, but I know that a lot of smartphones are using an increasing amount of AI and taking many exposures and then evaluating that data and putting it together for computational photography or capturing information from multiple lenses and, you know, making decisions for us that then we can still modify. What are some things that you guys are involved in and, and that we might not even realize as photographers changes that have been happening? Yeah, for, sorry for my, my pups in the background there. She's just checking the window. Hi, <laughs> people are wondering what's going on. Um, yeah, there, well, first on the, on the smartphones and such, you know, it's great that everyone now has the capability of capturing great photographs with their phone, right? Because really the best camera you ever have is the one that you have with you at the time. And so we've seen documented things that have happened because people have iPhones with it, whether it's photojournalism or magic moments and things like that. And I think that's phenomenal. Um, you know, but we, we also do a lot in using GPUs in the cloud with uh, partners like Adobe. Um, they've incorporated some of our technology in the Lightroom product that can do enhanced resolution and, and, and um, you know, a lot of times you might capture a photograph and you might have a need to do something with that photograph for print, but, oh, I didn't have it in the right, you know, it's not the large enough print or, or pixel count to do that. 
And uh, Lightroom has the ability to help you enhance that, which is a really good feature. Um, there's other stylistic things that we've done with our GAN technology uh, with Photoshop, so you can stylize photos and things like that. Um, and then to your point, we've seen AI used in lots of other areas, some that we're driving, you know, and others that are just taking place. I think it's, it's become one of those tools. You need to remove an object in the scene. It's easier to use AI to remove it than it is to go and use the magic wand and, you know, by hand do it. So I think a lot of that kind of stuff is taking place and we'll see more and more of it. And I yeah, think like from, when people are using a content aware tool in Photoshop, they may not be aware that content aware literally means it's using an AI algorithm to analyze it and make new pixels based upon the source that you're setting. And so it's kind of funny. I've seen a lot of photographers have a little bit of backlash. They're afraid that artificial intelligence is going to take away from their creativity, but they're not realizing that there's an AI engine that's auto-focusing their still camera. There's an AI engine when they use a healing brush that's you know sampling and coming up with new things that anytime we're asking the computer or the device to take information in and then make a decision or an output that we can you know evaluate and keep or lose that that really at some level is machine learning sure and it is just another tool i uh, you know when I, I talk to friends you might feel oh my gosh it's going to take take away our role of a photographer or something like that i'm like you kidding it's going to give you more tricks in your bag more things to, to, to play with. It's just another area of stuff that you can work with. There's no ever going to be a replacement for the artistry of a, of a musician, a photographer, a painter, et cetera. Even though we can use, you know, AI to make music, we can use AI to paint pictures, we can use all those things, but it, it's all, you know, taking input from the human artistic sense. And I think when it's used in conjunction with uh, doing new art, um, you get new capabilities. I mean, music didn't change just because you could sample and, and synthesize. It didn't like get rid of all these musicians, right? Um, there's still more music being made and it's even better because they can make it on a laptop in their bedroom. They can take their stuff out on the road and be a, a one man band with accompaniment that's all you know uh, based on synchronization and things like that. Um, and I think the same holds true in photography, You know, being able to use AI as you need it when you need it, um, it just gives you another tool. I, I really don't see it replacing, I, I, I see it enhancing. I mean, I'm constantly playing with all the different new tools that are out there and exploring and stuff like that. But I would never have been able to capture some of the photos that I had if I just said, everything do it AI, just you know, make the magic. It, it wouldn't work that way. And what we're seeing there is that these tools have different purposes. So like when I look at some of the AI tools, and I'm not sure which of these are by you, but like you brought up Photoshop. Uh, you know, there's a collection of neural filters in there. And I know that NVIDIA helped power some of those. Uh, you know, there's some, some of them are amazing to me and some of them don't feel quite there yet to me. And obviously it's an evolving tech. Like, so like the ones that excite me are, you know, when it's able to go in and colorize a black and white photo and analyze that data and make suggestions for a quick history. And, you know, we've also seen some tech of animating uh, older photos. Some of the stuff that you guys have, the stylistic transfer, I really love. You know, I see behind you, you have some stylized imagery. And a lot of times as photographers, our photographs have been used for artwork or for inspiration for artwork. And now the photographer could experiment with that process. They can try taking different source artwork or colors or textures and transfer that into their photography and mix the two together, allowing them to become like a, a mixed media artist. How does this change things? You know, is it, is it allowing different people to partake in different parts of the creative process? Is it giving more control to the original creator, the person who made the photograph? Um, I, I think yes to all. Actually, I, I did a book last year, and one of the things that I found was a lot of fun was using stylized treatments for some of the backdrops for photos to make them pop off the page and things like that. And I just, you know, I, I, I use these things as ways to um, enhance what I'm trying to get across. But to the other point, there's times where like, um, you know, you want to get an old photograph and you want to make it look new, or you want to get rid of scratches and tears and things like that. And AI is wonderful for being able to go in there um, and, and help make that an automated process. And, and I've had to do projects like that, where in the past you would by hand go in with Photoshop and it would take many hours 
just to try to fix something that was wrong. Whereas if I can use the computer for th things like that, that's great. It's not replacing any artistry or anything else. It's fixing a problem. And, and I think that's some of the best use cases for AI is fixing things when, when necessary. Like we will get to a point where you can capture a photo that might be blurry. And, and it's one of the hardest challenges is to unblurry photo because it's got to figure out what data is not there that should have been and things like that. Um, that would be a wonderful tool to have because I can't tell you how many times I've captured a photo only to look and like, because I shoot manual a lot of times and I missed it by this much. <laughs> and, uh, um, and then to the point of the stylizing things, you know, it's fun. Um, and, and these things behind me, that's actually a, a painting. Um, so, uh, and it's a storyboard and, and you can see all that stuff. So, um, but yeah, I do play with stylized photos from time to time. But I usually use them as an element. If I'm making a print or a book, I use it as backdrops, things like that. Because, you know, we've seen the painterly look for so long and, and things like that in, in, in what we're um, doing with, with treating photos and things. I think it's much more interesting to use it in the context of how to make your other work that you're really after pop. Makes sense. Now, you've worked on a lot of creative tools through the years. You were involved with Maya for 3D animation. You helped work on some of Apple's pro apps. You already mentioned that you worked at Industrial Light and Magic. You've been around creative people for years, as well as technology people and creative technology people and technical creative people. Why is it important that people balance this? Is there more opportunity for the creative professional who understands their tools or who embraces their tools in your mind? And what advice do you have for people who struggle with technology that, you know, that they can look forward to? Oh, uh, well, that, I'll answer that part first is uh, break things, have fun with things. You, you know, the great thing about digital now, uh, and Vincent said this to me when it was first starting out and we were all starting to play with digital cameras. And this, now I don't have to take 24 shots. I can take a thousand. I can just keep swapping cards. And, and he goes, so the biggest lesson out of this is, just take more, do more, exp experiment wherever you can. And as for the mix of art and science, you know, um, I was very fortunate to be at Pixar back in the early days, pre-movie studio and stuff. We actually made a computer and did software. And if there was ever a, a collaboration of art and science, it really was at Pixar. Um, one of my mentors, Alfie Ray Smith, uh, who did the Genesis scene in the Star Trek film, Right, that was computationally intensive and scientifically done with an artistic output. Um, plenty of things that Pixar did in the early days were about testing technology, motion blur with uh, with um, the the B film and and doing rendering with Toy Story and 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 Tin Toy and all those things. And and it was really how they were able to keep the art with the technology hand in hand that you know, the first time you saw a Pixar film, you were like, wow, it looks amazing. But it took you in because of the art of the story and the art of the storytelling is what kept you engaged with it. It wasn't just like, here's something you've never seen before because you get bored, right? You know, okay, I've seen it, now what? Um, and I think that that's a great example of a, a company that's blended science and technology throughout. I mean, every time they come out with a new film, there's stuff in there that you just go, it looks amazing, but I love the story. And, and it's been great working with them from, from an NVIDIA standpoint. They've, they've adopted our RTX technology. They actually were the ones that developed the USB, which is what we based Omniverse on, the universal scene description. Um, so from the standpoint of art and science together, I've been lucky to work with a lot of folks that have always combined those things. And I think it's one of the most exciting things for me. It's like, if it was just technology for technology's sake, I think it would get boring. It's when you mix it together that it gets exciting and, and new things happen. So I well, love it. Let's talk about that process because when I talk to a lot of folks, they fundamentally don't understand that, you know, the process of machine learning versus AI, there's a lot of overlaps, but they also don't understand what that training stage is. So could you walk us through maybe one of your existing technologies, how you go about training it? Like how did the computer learn how to style transfer, or how does it learn how to make these decisions? You know, my understanding of it, having worked a little bit on software myself, is that you know we tend to go out and gather 
source material and input from great artists. Like if we don't put good information in, we don't get good results out. Right. You got to train it with something. Um, I'll give you a real world example from another one of our customers. Um, I'll go back to Industrial Light and Magic. They made a film uh, a little over a year ago called The Irishman. Um, if you haven't seen it, it's, it's an amazing film. Um, and they used AI and machine learning on, on that film treme uh, in, in tremendous ways. They, the characters that are in there, De Niro and Al Pacino and, and um, uh, what's the other uh, name escapes me right Joe now? Joe Pesci, maybe? Joe Pesci, thank you. There you go. <laughs> um, they all play characters that age, uh, you know, 30, 40 years over the film. But they didn't, uh, ILM didn't just de-age them, you know, by manipulating images or by, you know, uh, using prosthetics or anything else. What they actually did is they took hundreds of thousands of images from the actors in younger days and throughout their career and trained the computer on what they would look like or how they would uh, move and behave in that character. Uh, and so they, I mean, how they were in when they were doing those, those roles, but then they applied that learning with AI to the character and what the character looked like. So the young Robert De Niro in the movie, The Irishman, isn't really looking like what Robert De Niro looked like when he was younger. He looks like the character in the film younger. But the, the machine learning that, that took place there was able to achieve that. Like the character heads in those films, if you watch those films, they're all CG. They're all kind of like puppet driven by the actors previous roles and previous mannerisms and things like that, then brought in to a, uh, you know, they did camera tracking on the face and things like that to drive the puppet or this digital character that was taking place in the film. But it was being driven with all this information that the computer had learned previously. So it didn't just look like somebody like got rid of the wrinkles or got rid of things like that. But instead, it, you felt like you were seeing that character 20, 30 years prior in the film. So it's really amazing. It's just that's one example that kind of comes to mind. Yeah, no, that's very exciting. And it certainly adds options for storytelling and creativity. How about some of the other things? You know, you talked about like the ability for AI to potentially help sharpen or add details. How does it learn about that? You know, is it is it is it mathematics? Is it predictive? You know, does it have to identify what's in the picture so that it can make the right choice? Uh, all of the above. It has to learn, like, it's not going to, when it, it puts something there that wasn't there, but it looks like it belonged, it's only because it knew what was, should have been there from previous learnings. So in order for a picture to be de-blurred, it's going to have to know what a sharper picture in that same context would normally look like. And, and that's a really, really hard problem. Like, it's easier to relight, it's easier to uh, to, to blur <laughs> um, and things like that, than it is to get information that wasn't there and put it in the picture. And so the way that the computer and AI functionality would have to do something like that is to take hundreds of thousands, if not millions of images in and understand and learn what a sharp photograph, photograph of, a, uh, of, of a person would look like, you know, whether it's the person you're shooting or other things. And once it understands that, and then you take a, a picture of that same person, but it's blurry. Now the computer says, I know what it's supposed to look like sharp. So I'm going to start replacing the pixels that are, you know, out of, out of whack and, and, and fix them. And it should look like it, it will. Now, that's a really hard problem to solve right now. And we haven't seen that kind of a, a solution yet. It's, it's stuff that there's lots of experimenting going on and things like that. But imagine when we get to that point, not only from a blurred standpoint or, or archived footage that might be improved upon, things like that. There's a whole world of opportunities that I think we're going to see a renaissance when that AI takes place in going through old archival footage and photographs and modernizing them to see what they would look like and how they would be um, today. Yeah, I, I have a friend who's worked on a lot of material for some television networks. And they've taken a lot of legacy and archival footage and used AI to remove scratches and noise and also to colorize it, uh, you know, still an artistic process. So their backgrounds were as colorists that would normally work on a film, but they used AI to identify and make selections so that they could add color into the scenes. And it was impressive because there's a lot of that old material that people 
struggle to engage with. You know, as we're talking to the next generation, you know, for them, looking at black and white imagery may seem strange. You know, they don't, they didn't grow up where, like I did, where, oh yeah, you know, 80% of the time when I read a newspaper, it was in black and white and I appreciated black and white photographs and I had to make black and white photographs because sometimes that was my deliverable uh, or even bought black and white film. You know, for other folks, black and white just looks like an Instagram filter and they don't understand it. And so making that content accessible is interesting. Um, you know, we've also seen instances where actors, as you brought up, have been able to play future roles. The Mandalorian, also an ILM property, a Disney property, recently did that with Mark Hamill. Um, with all of these tools, do we as artists, what obligation do we have to disclose our methods? You know, do we need to disclose when we're using AI? Do you foresee any potential uh, moral issues coming up in this path? You know, we certainly have heard about deep fake technology of people, uh, you know, doing things incorrectly with footage of misrepresentation. You know, I think it's like all things, right? All things digital, there's the opportunity for bad. Yeah, I, and that can happen with any technology, right? I, you know, but I think, does an artist have the right to disclose? I don't know. I think you listen to music and they don't say every single thing that was used to make that song. Uh, it's like, are you enjoying the finished product? And I think if a photograph is taken and different technologies are used in that photograph, whether you, the, it wasn't really the sky that was in the photograph, but I put one in because it made the picture pop or something like that. I think in those cases, the, the ends really justify the means and the, and the, and the sake of the art. So, um, and, and then other times they like to demystify it. You know, there's, there's folks out there that, you know, release an album and then release all the parts to the album and let people go remix it and things like that. So I, I think it's, you know, it's all in the uh, hands of the artists and what they're doing, whether they want to reveal the kinds of tricks and tips and technologies that they've used. Um, as long as you like the finished product, who cares, right? Yeah, I think I think it'll obviously there'll be there'll be pockets of industry where it matters. So if you're working in a news or a documentary type production where's the where there's the expectation for full disclosure, you need to make that. You're creating imagery for real estate. We've gone through and have brushed out, you know, little things and it. it's like, oh, you know, there was a little surprise from the dog. Oh, there was a little spatch of brown grass. Let's fix that. You know, we're gonna no use one no one looks at a real estate photo and expects it to be realistic. I like when you go into the room and it's like, this is so small, the photograph, it looks so big. And it's like, yeah, the tips and yeah. the tricks and making everything HDR and it just, you know, all that stuff. Yeah, that, that always cracks me up that, that how much they, they're just so blatant about it. You know, a photographer looks and it's like, how wide of a lens did you use to get this small little room to look like that? And, yes. and they even with staging, like all the furniture that goes in is smaller. Stuff like that. So that's a whole industry that we can go on and on about. But yes, I think the, per the perspective. Yeah, the 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 idea that uh, technology and photography mix together like art and science. I think it's just a natural, right? I I love what we're doing with Adobe and and the different things there. And there's some even cooler stuff coming. Um, you'll see some new things that that we talked about in AI at the upcoming GTC conference next month. Um, and it's, you know, it, it's, uh, we're still in the early days. It's still really, really early days. I mean, you know, photorealistic ray trace rendering is just a couple years old now that, that we invented at NVIDIA and we're just starting to see the fruits of all that stuff with, with what customers are doing with it in real time games and films and TV. And it's amazing. Yeah. There, there's the opportunity there that, you know, Right now, when the sky is not the way we want it, we have the ability to replace that with another photograph. And, and there's a certain amount of being able to remap it. But in the future, it, you know, it, it's already possible now. It just isn't the sort of thing that's in everybody's hands. There's nothing preventing you from generating the weather or changing the sky to what you want or completely relighting an image uh, because it's very possible. You know, we already see the ability to relight a photograph obviously rudimentary, but, you know, I'm still moderately impressed on the iPhone with portrait mode when I can go in and change the different types of lighting. And, you know, I've, I've seen firsthand with some of the technology I get to work with the ability to separate humans from the backdrop to do background replacement or to change things. Um, some of these tasks we've always done, people have always done special effects. We've had green screen for almost as long as we've had a movie industry, you know, that ability has been around for a very long time. 
um, you know, back to very early, uh, you know, Sinbad and Seven Seas and blue and green screen technology. So I just think it keeps getting better and more believable. And I think that that's not necessarily a bad thing. You know, it, it just means that more people can use this. Yeah. I mean, you brought up the Mandalorian where, you know, what's amazing there is that's all being done in a warehouse uh, in front of an LED screen. And uh, and the uh, the amount of technology going in there that drive the real time 3D that's being projected that's being displayed on that screen and then lighting the room and lighting the characters and everything else, what that's actually doing is more like what traditional filmmaking was doing. If you watch an old Buster Keaton film or something like that, and there's special effects in there, that's all done in camera. Like they had to set that all up and they had to work it all out and then they they take the shot. And that same concept of bringing the technology into the camera so the director has more tools, more tips and tricks, and more things that they can do in order to tell their story. I mean, they're very similar, right? It's just that it's just that the technology has gotten better and, and more creative from a 3D and, and you know standpoint of photorealism and things. Um, but really, the director gets to look through the lens and see what it's going to look like and make his decisions or her decisions based on what they see versus having to wait for it to go off and render, bring it back, see if it matched, things like that. So it's more like what was done, you know, in Hitchcock movies and Buster Keaton and all that stuff, where everything was done in camera or with matte paintings, tripping the camera out of a piece of glass with a, uh, an area that would show the camera, what the camera sees and the rest was all painting, things like that. So traditional storytelling tools, right? That's, that's really what it's about. And I think from a photographer standpoint, it's traditional photography. I want to show... I want to capture a moment and I want to share that moment. Well, and, and I, I love that because the, you, you know, that virtual set technology or that projected set technology being driven by game engines and things like that, you know, a few directors started using that as a lighting tool initially. They never intended to like actually shoot that. But I remember seeing some test footage of, oh, you know, if we could create the feeling of being in hyperspace while the actors are in the Millennium Falcon cockpit and they're seeing the streaks of light and it's hitting them, it makes the footage we're capturing better and it makes it feel more realistic and it helps put them into the character so they feel like they're flying the ship. And then all of a sudden, because the gaming engines got better and the real-time rendering got better, plus display technology got better, somebody suddenly said, you know, instead of just like using this as a lighting source, we could just put it back there and cut out 12 steps. Some more, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I just love it. I think that there's so much virtual production going on right now. Uh, Midnight Sky was the, all done that way. Um, uh, there's the different TV shows, commercials, et cetera. It, it brings a new, um, a new set of technologies back into that camera, like I said, for the, the director to make better decisions on the spot. And I do think from the standpoint of the actors, too, it brings the actors more into the role because typically it was green screen, tennis balls and things. And, OK, now show me the dinosaur. I want you to show me. The, you know? And uh, and now it's like they look at the screen and there is the creature and, you know, and they can interact with it a lot better. Yeah, that that continues to open up opportunities, which is exciting. So as we balance all of this out, you know, you're continuing to see innovations in technology. Um, Obviously, you can't share things that aren't out yet, but is there anything that's recently come out? You know, I've, you know, back in the past, the recent past, before we all got locked up more in our homes, you know, I would frequently see you guys at industry trade shows and you'd be demonstrating some of the latest innovations. We haven't been able to see some of that stuff in person. Um, what are some of the things that has recently come out that you find exciting that you think are going to help us as photographers or as artists? Oh boy, lots of things. Um, I will plug our GTC conference again because in about four or five weeks, you'll see some amazing things at our GTC conference virtually. So, and can um, regular people register for that or do they need a yeah, special invite? Any, nope, anybody can register for it. Registration is open now, just nvidia.com. You'll see our GTC banners there. You'll see lots of things about Omniverse, uh, lots of things about uh, other technologies that are happening across the company from robotics and healthcare. And, data science and there's just a whole it's like you know it's like disneyland for technos <laughs> it's so much fun um and recent things that i've seen that comes out like I'll, I'll bring up the midnight sky again i thought that was a, a beautifully done film that the the visuals were stunning um and uh 
you know, I just look at that and I think, gosh, so much of that is is just real time graphics projected um, through the uh, stagecraft, the ILM stagecraft system, and it's just like it's amazing, right? How much that would have cost to go shoot that out on on location or then CG it afterwards and all of those things. Um, I thought that was really amazing. Um, there's there's so much. I mean, you know, the latest Pixar film, you know, uh, Soul was just beautifully done. And there were so many things in there that captured moments in the sense of uh, telling a great story, but we're also technically advancing, um, you know, things that we hadn't seen before in the way they were doing it. Um, and then as far as photography and, and stuff, I, I hinted a little bit about this stuff with, with Adobe, there's more coming. And, and I think that uh, they're looking to solve problems as well as do the, the cool GAN type of things. I think one of the things that they're they're looking at from most likely feedback that they've had from a lot of folks is I need I need AI to help me solve a problem. And um, I know from my my own experience, I had a an older photograph that um, a magazine recently reached out and said, can we get this in a higher resolution? Because we want to print it for this artist that we're doing a story about. And I said, that's the resolution that was taken at. I can try a few things. And and I did try a few things, nothing that really, you know, because it wasn't shot the way it, it, it could have been for modern tools, but I know eventually it'll get to, to that point where you'll have a, an older photograph, but I need it here, I need it higher, I need it HDR, I need it whatever. And I look forward to having those kinds of things because it allows you to kind of revisit some of the artwork that you've done in the past. So again, to me, AI is always great to help solve problems and expand some of your horizons on, you know, creativity aspect. The solving problems, though, is the most important thing for me. Yeah, I think I, that opens up exciting opportunities because we all like our work to remain relevant and to be able to reach into the archives. You know, we look at the different delivery forms we have today, and in some ways, you know, there's more output options than I think any of us could have anticipated between all the different screens and the different sizes and the ratios and the different forms of print and display and electronic and the demand for movement. I think it gets increasingly challenging. One other area that I find exciting with AI is the ability for it to help us organize our content. You know, we talked about how AI needs to be able to identify what's in images. You know, the other day I spent forever searching to try to find something. I had misplaced something. And, you know, instead of searching by file name or searching by anything else, I started searching by some text that I knew was in the file and it found it. And we have some photo technology that does that too, where it's going to try to guess what's in the picture. I think this is exciting because as artists, as we age, we get such large bodies of work, we could forget what we worked on or we could forget about the gems. I, I was reading an excellent book uh, about Prince and his photographer who worked with him for years purposefully went back to his archives and just unearthed hundreds of photos for a book that had never been published before because in the past, they only needed the one for the album cover. And to see the rest of those images and the ones that didn't make it was just incredible. And, and all this great work that we've often done, the hundreds of things we captured, the one image becomes iconic or widely used, there may be gems that we've forgotten about. So what is it well, great for here? I, I think that's, you're, you're touching on something that's gonna be a big, big deal is um, because right now you can do some searching on places, locations and times with you know Google Photos and, and um, Apple's photos and things like that. And, and they're good, but if you, have, if you don't have all your photos in there, like mine are archived on, on servers, because I do, if I do a concert, I'll shoot five, 6,000 shots in a night because I'm shooting in burst and I'm trying to capture, but I only need to produce for the band like 40. And so I'll find those. And to your point, there are times where I go, I know I had, like I shot uh, Paul McCartney's last show at Candlestick, which was, and they let me shoot the entire show, which was a whole blast because most photographers don't get to. And, and, you know, I can still go back and revisit those and things like that, but I go, gosh, there's so many other shows that I wish I could just like, remember, did I get that shot of the drummer? Did I get that shot of, you know, the only way to do it is manually go out, unarchive them, bring them down, go through them all, all that. And I would love to have a, a, a technology that would kind of go do all that for me and, and help me to search 
for things like I might say, you know, drummer and guitar player together, you know, and here's all the shots, you know, so it would have to know what the content was, it would have to show, know what a drummer was or what a guitar player was, but we're not far. That stuff is coming. Oh, yeah. And, you know, for archival stuff, as I was saying earlier, too, for archival footage for you know, photojournalists and TV shows and sports events and things like that. Imagine when, you know, we have all that capability to say, like, show me the 69 Super Bowl, but I want to see it in HDR and 4K. And right. just bring it to you. You know, rewatch them, some of those moments, but not look like you're, you know, or not make it feel like you're watching some antiquated thing. And there, there's really two things there, because I, I did some work with Major League Baseball. Uh, as they innovated, and they have an incredible amount of information that's incredibly valuable to them. People are very passionate about baseball. Right now, everything is logged by humans. So as every stat happens, all of that data gets injected into every piece of footage and photo that's being taken, and it's all synced up with timestamps. So they really could say, oh, you know, I'm a coach, and I want to see every time these two players faced each other for the last eight years, and oh, I'd like to see it when it was a high pressure situation where there was two people out and it was late in the game and they were tired, you know, and you could play all this incredible material. Well, this is going to open up new opportunities because, you know, we could start to see as more and more multi-camera productions are being done or more and more events are covered by pools of photographers that as the people who are responsible for the storytelling afterwards, magazine editors, website editors, or even the end consumer, if they want to go passionate and deep dive in, they could see some amazing things. I saw some very interesting stuff that was done with some of the footage from the Capitol Hill riots as they used AI to scrape and pull all of those materials together, sync them up with timestamps so that you were able to historically evaluate what happened. Politics aside, it was just a recent event where there was motivation to take lots of different sources from lots of places and organize it. I think this opens up interesting opportunities because it means as historic events happen or as big big things happen, we could pool this knowledge into something that becomes very searchable or usable by people. Let me give you a more fun example than a sure. riot. How about a concert? You go to a, a photograph of a musician in a concert and there's metadata to that photograph and most all concerts are recorded these days, right? Whether, yeah. you know, some like Pearl Jam and, and Bruce and all that, they'll make them available. Um, but wouldn't it be great to just look at the photograph and be able to have AI go say, it was this song and this day and this location, here it is. Yeah. And I've, I've often had this idea that I'd like to do uh, another music book, but every page give you the ability to listen to the song as it was being played so you could look at the photograph and hear the moment and kind of be taken back to that thing. There's the technology is there. There's information in the photograph already about its location, its time. And um, and then there's there's information out on the web to know at that time in that location, this song was played and there's a recording of it in this place. And I'm going to go pull that and deliver it to you as you as you have asked me to do. Um, I think that would be fascinating right imagine going through even old books that you could do that with where you'd have to apply the ai to it if it didn't have the metadata but imagine like going through an old beetle book of concerts and stuff mm -hmm. and you know hear that show in washington dc on that date and stuff like right. that a lot more fun than, than searching out riots <laughs> right no, absolutely and and that's that's just a different type of history you know it's it's interesting because we we see that proliferation of information and now that all this old material is being digitized, there's an opportunity to bring it forward. You know, AI has served an important role in helping clean up archival recordings, both video and photo and audio. Uh, you know, you mentioned its ability to deal with issues. I think for almost anybody, that's probably one of the, the least offensive uses because helping us restore things back to their original state helps us work past some of the limitations of the formats or the mediums that we've worked with, right? right. Solving problems. And that's where it's at its best. You know, I think all breakthroughs and technologies help solve a problem. And, and when they do that, uh, the, there's stuff that's better from it. Yeah, you can do bad things with it. You know, you can run over somebody in a car, but a car can also get you to two from one spot to another spot fast. And so it's all in how it's used and, and how it's applied. Um, but I love the fact that you can use today's technology to solve problems that happened in the past 
you talk about archival music and things like that. You know, recently, um, Giles Martin has been going back to the various Beatle records and, and redoing, not, not redoing them, but remastering them and cleaning them up and making them clearer. And, and, and the, the fidelity is like you're in the room with the band and you listen to it. Now, he hasn't replaced anything. He hasn't, you know, re-recorded anything. He's used technology and his amazing ears to make it sound the way it was supposed to sound even though it's not limited by the things it was when it was first recorded or delivered. So uh, stuff like that, I just, I, I, I love, I'm just, you know. Absolutely, I've, I've bought every one of those remasters for the Beatles, I've enjoyed it. I recently picked up the Sign of the Times remaster from Prince and it's the same thing. It's just, it's so interesting to both see the different takes. You know, I loved how the Beatles did almost every time they recorded a song, they would just do it completely different. It was like they, they weren't happy with the creativity. There was so much creativity there. And that's great that we can organize that information. We can bring it forward. So you mentioned the GTC conference coming up. So I encourage folks to check that out. What are some of the types of things that they'll see at that conference? Uh, you know, what sort of uh, topics are covered and, and what, could the, what would a photographer enjoy about it? Lots of magic. <laughs> so there are, uh, well, photographers, you'll see things from our partners with Adobe and, and others that are doing some really interesting things in that space. You'll see image manipulation in general. Uh, you'll see some new technologies with the Omniverse platform in, uh, across the different verticals I talked about, manufacturing, architecture, m and &E. um, It is really, the, it is the time that we get to show what our customers and researchers are doing with our technologies. And, and it's really kind of a showcase place for all of those things. Some of it are in real world examples and some of it is here's what's coming and we're gonna show you some sneak peeks, but you know, there's, there's so many tracks and I'd, I'd invite everyone to go look at our website and see all the things. You can build a schedule, you can watch it, you know, you can watch some of the stuff live, you can watch it at your leisure afterwards, things like that. Um, it'll go on for that first week. And then the second week, we're going to have like kind of a, uh, other, other sessions and things. So kind of like our unplugged, if you will. And, and um, just, you know, what can you see? It's like, well, what can you see when you're looking out at the stars? There's a million things out there that can come to you. I, I think depending on what your interest is, take a look. There's chances are we're going to be addressing something in it. And it always starts by the keynote. The keynote is going to be the most fun. There's a lot of surprises being planned. And and uh, that's the most exciting thing is that kicks everything off, right? So I highly recommend watching that live. Richard, I really appreciate you making time to join us today. Uh, you know, in just a second, if you have any closing thoughts or, or things you want folks to know, I just want to encourage folks to both take a look at the NVIDIA opportunity, as well as to make sure to take a look at your website too, where they could see your photography at richardcaris.com. Thank you, Richard, for joining us. Is there any other thoughts you have for, for artists out there who are, you know, opening their mind to these new opportunities, anything about embracing change or in you know, oh, yeah. staying invigorated? Embrace change is a, is a, is a mantra that, um, you know, uh, so many friends of mine, we've used that for so many, for so many things. If it's new technology, get it. Before you even read the manual, play with it. Just start doing stuff with it. And then if you get lost, read the manual. You know, I think the best things come with no manual. So you kind of got to be forced to explore and, and, and play. Um, and uh, yeah, I think that's, that's the, the best thing I can say for anybody using new technologies that have been timid or afraid or something like that is, you know, overcome that by, by not letting it be the thing that's a barrier for you. Like I said, you know, if I, if I get a new, new piece of technology, whether it's a, you know, a, a toy synthesizer or, you know, a, a delay or something for my studio, I rarely look at the manual for a few weeks. I just start playing and what happens if I do this, what happens, and I kind of learn it in a different way. But then I go to the manual to refer to like, oh, that's how I can do that. Oh, that's how. But I've already kind of, you know, managed the, my interaction with the device in my own way. And I'd recommend that's a, that's a great way for, for folks, whether it's a digital camera, an iPhone, or, you know, whatever you're playing with is just jump in. You're not going to break anything. You know, so what have you got to lose? Absolutely. There's always the undo key and we can always back our data up. Well, Richard, this has been very exciting. And, you know, thank you for all the hard work that you guys are doing at NVIDIA. It's always great to see this innovation and, and things pushing forward. 
I appreciate you making time today and thanks for the folks who joined us live today. We'll be reposting this interview to share with the broader audience, but I do appreciate some of you guys sharing questions throughout today that we were able to weave into our interview. Richard, thank you very much for making the time. Sure thing. Thanks so much. Bye, everybody.